People just don't know what to do with it. It's the largest collection of responsibly sourced human remains in the country. John exclusively acquires bones sourced from the once thriving medical bone trade, which eventually collapsed in 1985. These were pieces of individuals that donated their bodies to medical science. We do not work with anything from graves or ossuaries, as well as anything tribal. Up until the 80s, it was required for medical students and professionals in Europe and in the US to buy a real human skeleton set for learning purposes. But today, thousands of these human remains are ending up in the hands of non-medical individuals, either through inheritance or estate sales. We get between 30 to 50 emails a month of people saying, hey, my grandfather just passed away. We were cleaning out his basement or attic and we found a real human skeleton. We don't know what to do with it. It's creeping us out. Due to how they were cleaned chemically, there's no DNA left in the bone. So they can't be DNA sequenced and repatriated because of this anonymity. They cannot be buried because improper disposal of human remains is a crime. And the majority of medical museums that exist in the U.S. are not equipped to handle this scale of human remains that exists. So what do we do with them? In order to understand how we got here, it's important to delve into a particularly murky chapter of medical history. In Europe and the U.K. in the 17 and 1800s, there was such a need and demand for medical remains within the educational field that there used to be rampant grave robbing. This led to a myriad of laws that were implemented, such as the Murder Act of 1751. It stated that if you were a convicted murderer, the medical field could use your body for medical science. This still didn't quander the demand and need for medical remains, and it had gotten so bad that mausoleums were begun to be constructed to try to protect these remains, as well as cages on graves. The Anatomy Act of 1832 gave medical professionals and their students legal access to cadavers from workhouses, hospitals, and prisons that were unclaimed for over 48 hours. It also made it possible for families to donate their relatives' bodies for medical study. This is what eventually led to the medical bone trade starting at around 1920 to 1984. The medical bone trade expanded globally, with India eventually becoming the primary exporter in the 50s. Typically, the medical companies would say, Hey, if you donate your loved one's body to medical science, we will oftentimes pay for the funerary costs or give the families of origins um, money. This is where we see a lot of tension in the industry and a lot of injustices take place. In March of 1985, a horrific discovery in India led to the collapse of the industry. There was eventually a bone dealer that was caught with 1,500 child skeletons in one of their warehouses, and this eventually led to a nationwide ban. As a result of the ban in India, medical supply companies turned to plastic cast and injection molding. Today, the medical bone trade has mainly become a resale market. In the U.S., selling human bones is legal, except in Louisiana, Georgia, and Tennessee. Our largest clients are schools and universities. Our second largest client are members of Search and Rescue. They buy our loose bones and use them to help train cadaver dogs to learn the scent of human remains. We try not to sell these pieces to the general public. Through the museum and his large TikTok following, he hopes to foster dialogue towards finding solutions to this complex issue. These are not decor, it's not a vanity. This was a real individual with a real life that should be treated with respect and dignity. So we do our best to preserve them and display them to the best of our ability.